Okay. Hello everybody. I'm Kathleen Duncan. I think a lot of you already know me. I am an AEW board me member for a couple more months. Member of Cascade Wood Turners in Southwest Washington. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to, we're not in my loft where I usually pierce, but we are in my kitchen for the sake of getting a little bit more room. Um, what I'm going to be showing today is piercing and the project we'll be working on will be an angel and we'll be doing her wings. Um, before we get started, I want to talk a little bit about shop safety. Uh, although we're not turning today, when you do turn, I recommend a face shield, but for piercing, we have a different set of safety equipment. Number one, earplugs. The noise from the piercing tools are very, very uh, shrill, and they can damage your ears. Dust protect protection of some sort of respirator, a uh, foam mask. I find that these masks work very, very well when I'm piercing. They keep the smoke and the dust out. I don't use eye protection when I'm turning, but I do use magnifiers, either magnifiers or reading glasses. So um, I think that's all I have on the safety, but please, if you are piercing or turning, do practice safe practices. Okay. All right, what we're going to do is I have turned some little bowls that are very thin. They're two millimeters. What I start with is a block of wood on a screw chuck. I go ahead and turn this completely the, the size that I want and it is very important when you're turning it, once you have it turned, you need to get the depth that you're going to be using. So we, the turn bowl will want to mark what the outside depth is going to be. So you'll see why this is important in a second. Alright, once you have your bowl turned, what you're going to do is have a waste block, bring it up to with your tailstock to the bowl that's turned, and then use a daub of hot glue to mark it. What this is going to do, it will keep your bowl centered, and with so when you reverse it, everything will be centered. This is really important when you're turning two millimeters thick. Otherwise, if it's out of balance, It'll be maybe half a millimeter on one side and three and a half on the other. So uh, use your hot melt glue and then go ahead, reverse it, and turn as you normally do. At this point, it's really important that you know where the bottom of your bowl is. Remember, we, we glued it in so we can't measure from the outside, but you're going to use your depth marker, which I don't have marked correctly on this one. And you can find out where the bottom is so that you'll keep turning until you reach the, the true depth of the bowl. And then, um, one of the things when you are turning, because it's important to turn to two millimeters, what I do is use a digital caliper. Turn it on here. And as you're turning, measure constantly. So I turn with a small bowl gouge and then I do use a negative rate scraper to refine it. But almost after every pass, when I'm getting to the thickness I want, I'll stop and I'll measure it. It is extremely important that it be uniform in thickness and uh, about two millimeters. If it's thicker than two millimeters, you can't pierce it. So once you have the bowl turned, you have to get it off the glue block. And the best way to do that is to leave it in the chuck, get a hair dryer, turn it on hot, and slowly rotate the bowl and push very gently with your thumb. The heat, because the bowl is so thin, it will go right through it and it will pop off. A few more tips on turning thin. You have to use sharp tools, make slow cuts, and never go back. If you have finished an area, the wood is going to move, so you don't want to go back because then you'll get an uneven surface or it will break. Um, I know because I've done it a couple, more than once. Okay, this is another trick that I learned uh, from one of our demonstrators years ago about checking a bowl shape. It's just a zip tie, and if you hold it up to the bowl, 
when it's on the lathe, the bottom. You can, if there are any gaps in there, it's a high spot or a low spot, this gives you an easy reference. It also is a, a good way to check the shape of the bowl and make sure that you have the shape that you're going for. When you're turning, you have to use a straight grain, hard, dense wood. If you try to use something that's soft, it just won't work. The wood will fuzz up. It's just too hard to turn it thin. Um, I would suggest using box elder, madrone, hard maple, cherry, koa. Koa is a, kind of a dark wood. It's not my favorite to work with, but there are people that really, really do like turning that. Many people think that piercing is just a matter of punching holes in a piece of wood. Uh, the more I've looked at other people's work, I've found that people have really their own style to turning. The first thing I turned, I took over to Jim Christiansen in Moscow and I said, I hate it, the holes are so small, should I put it back on the, uh, work on it again and make it, the holes bigger? And he looked at me and said, no, that's your style. You make small holes, other people make larger holes. So I started looking at other people's styles. This is pretty much the style of hole that I make. It's very random. I like using a lot of texture around the outside of, of my turnings. It's a little bit different some, from somebody else. This may be familiar to some of you, this style. This is Dave Goodschmidt. If you look at Dave's work, it's a lot of a beautiful straight lines, short straight lines. And his work is very, very uniform. It's very precise. So this is another style. Richard Kennedy in England has um, another style. His is straight lines where uh, Dave has a little bit of curve in his. Richard's has less curve and it's, it's very, very uh, random straight lines where Dave's are grouped together in sets. So this is a, yet another style. J. Paul Fennell, who is influenced by biology, his are more organic shapes. He does a lot of carving on his, but this his shape would be a larger shape and it's more organic. The master, Ben Foe, it is impossible to demonstrate his work. But what Ben did, he used a negative space to accent a positive space. So this is supposed to be a moon. I'm not sure if it looks that much like a moon, but that's, this is kind of in Ben's style. So as you start piercing, you need to arrive at your own style. I'm, I play with other people's styles just to see how they work. And I always end up coming back to my own. I'd still like to be able to cut some really nice size uniform large holes. That's just not my style. All right, this is the angel we're going to make. This is a November demo, so I thought we'd work on a Christmas ornament that's a little bit different. This is a little bowl that we would have already have turned. So now I'm going to demonstrate exactly how we're going to lay out the pattern for the angel. All right, in order to lay out the angel's the location of the cutouts on her background. What I've done, I've taken my tie. When the piece was on the lathe, I marked the center, and then I just used this uh, zip tie to make a line down the middle. Then I could freehand the area where I cut out, but that's not very accurate. So I use whatever I can. Um, a quarter, I think, is probably a good size to use. And a bottle cap is also a good size to use. So then what I'll do, because I want them to be uniform, I've drawn a line down the paper. And I use, I'm just using the hole for kind of a guide. So I'll kind of change it a little bit, change the shape, what I think I want for my angel's wings. The back shape to look like. So then I'll cut these out. Here. 
And the very important next step is to wad them up. Because if we were to try to fit a flat piece of paper on the wood, it's not going to work. So wad them up so that they'll conform to the wood. And then unwrinkle them if you can get them apart without tearing them. That's a good idea. Now we need to trace, outline these onto the wood. So what I use are glue dots. These are kind of... Okay, now that we have our uh, adhesive on here, we can locate where we want the cutout for the upper part of the wing to be. And the reason I drew the line was so that I could use it to center the cutout. And then we'll put the bottom on and Again, center it, use the line to center it. And the paper, because it's been wrinkled, will conform to the wood. Now that looks a little bit more like a wing. So what we can do is take a pencil and outline where the cutout is going to be. Uh, I use graphite pencils. Um, five, seven, five, six, or seven B is what I like. It's a dark pencil. Um, it's not particularly hard. So use that to mark where the wing is going to be. And then check it against your angel and make sure it's going to be a, the appropriate size. Um, I think that for this angel, who just lost her halo, the bottom cutout isn't quite big enough. So we're, we're going to come across here and just by eyeball make it a little bit bigger and try to keep it so it matches on both sides. Now we can take our pattern off and um, when I'm piercing I won't pierce right up to the edge. I like to have a nice even margin all the way around. If you look at the sample Angel. She's got a nice border all the way around. Also, we can't pierce in the back where we're going to fasten it to the angel. So it's a good idea to lay your angel down on the work and just roughly draw a line where you're not going to be piercing. Then we can go back and use our zip tie and straighten that out a little bit. So for me, piercing is a lot of just guessing, you know, estimating how things look. Um, erasing on the wood, I use kneadable erasers that come from Michaels or Joann's or anybody else. I've found some of my work where it, there's a lot of intricate drawing, what I'll do is spray it with shellac before I start pencil because the pencil does get worked into the pores of the wood. And if it's sprayed with shellac, it'll, you can dissolve the shellac and the pencil with just isopropyl alcohol. So that's one of the things that I use. But for this, we're just going to draw directly on the wood. Now, I do want the border, so I'm going to pencil that in just roughly where I want the border to be. both sides and try to keep it relatively the same width throughout. And then we'll go to the bottom. Go to the other side. Okay, that's roughly what our wing is going to look like. Before we get started piercing, we have to better decide what style of wing we want. Uh, this wing has very delicate cutouts down here. This wing is just very plain. 
it's got kind of a scalloped here. Um, this wing has got the scallop, but the, the, to try to replicate feathers, they're kind of in lines down here. So for this angel, I think what we're going to do with her wing is let's try to do some of these cuts. I think they're, they're kind of fun to do. So we'll maybe do draw in three cuts, try to make them the same on both sides. And uh, we're probably going to just do random cuts all through here, but, <coughs> excuse me, um, we'll need to keep this area clear for these cuts for the wings to go in. Okay, so this is the area we're going to be piercing, and we'll be cutting out this area and this area. All right. All right, the tool that I'm using today is an NSK Presto. It is air-driven and it goes at about 300,000 RPM. Most of the micromotors go at 30,000 RPM. <coughs> the burrs that are friction fit, I'll pop it out, and it, they just, in order to put them back in, it's just a matter of putting the burr in and then using um, a little device to push it in until it clicks. Um, this tool, for me, it gets really cold because it is air driven, so I usually wear a glove with it. Uh, these are gor Gorilla gloves. They're very flexible and they work really well for me. Um, this particular model has a floor foot pedal. There are some models where you have a, a switch you can turn it off and on. I particularly like the floor foot model, uh, foot pedal because I have complete control. I can stop it instantly. You know, it's running, I can stop it. If there's some problem, I can stop it. Where, okay, before we start, uh, I use a little piece of brass, this welding rod, and I stroke the tip of the burr with that just to clean off the carbon if there's carbon there and then while I'm piercing I will come back frequently and, and do this. You may also notice that I have a wrist rest. Uh, I just find that it works a lot better. This is just a long tube filled with grain with a slip cover because this gets really really dirty. Okay what I'm using I'm going to bring a fan in. Uh, this is to pull the smoke away from me. I'm not wearing a respirator today. Ordinarily I would. Um, it's got a charcoal filter on it. It's not the best one in the world, but it's, it, it's better than nothing. So we're going to go ahead and use that. And I'll try to talk over it. Um, when I'm piercing, you try to keep the um, Burr perpendicular to your work, and it's just a matter of plunging the tool in and making some cuts. Plunging the tool in and cutting. Now, I like to keep my work totally random. I also like to see where I, I've been rather than where I'm going because I want my holes to be fairly uniform in size and I want the distance between the holes also to be uniform. When you're cutting we move in the same direction as the tool, so it's a clockwise. And I'm going to put some lines in here. I can go back and clean up a hole a little bit. Somebody asked me one time if I've ever gotten myself with the uh, end of the burr. Um, I had two gloves on one day and I could feel it on the tip of my finger. Uh, I didn't get my 
myself that my glove has a little tiny bit of a hole in it. So I draw a, whatever I feel like putting on here, whatever shape I'll do. Uh, straight lines and then um, kind of long squiggly lines. If I see an area like right in here that needs something, it'll just get a small hole in it. So come back here. Uh, D is the shape I like with a line in front of it. And sometimes a dot down here. So it's just totally random, unlike some of the other samples that I showed you. And I try to keep them, no, these are more or less in a straight line. I would rather they not be, so I have to kind of watch where I'm going. Sometimes I'll put something in that looks a little bit like a flower. So it may have a petal in there. You really have to look to find it. Okay. One of the things I do in my shop, I keep a brush. Oh, I'm not sure where my brush is down here. Uh, and constantly I'm sweeping up the soot and the uh, little bits of wood that come out. It's just, it's sooty. And I just as soon not have it spread all over the place. So I have a, up in the loft I have a little dust buster and then I very frequently will stop while I'm working and clean. Clean it up as I go along. It's just I, I just prefer to, to have the area less messy. Go back up to the edge. Notice we're keeping our border. So in the sample, you notice that the wood is very, very white. Um, wood doesn't normally grow that white. I think that one is maple. And what I do when I finish my piece, and I have another one that I'm working on right now, I really like bleach wood, so I use a two-part wood bleach on the pieces that I, I want to be really white. And I think the angels look very, very nice with a very, very white wing. So rather than finish the whole piece, I think what we'll do is just, I'll show you how to work with this part. We'll cut these away. Um, as I said before, you always are going clockwise or the, the direction of the cut. I'm going to start right down here at the bottom. 
and even though I'm going uphill, I'm really going clockwise. And for a long cut, it looks a lot better if you move the teeth rather than your hands. And let's just get this out of the way so we're going to cut straight up. Notice I'm, I'm, my hand is straight, steady, and then I'm moving the wood. And there's a lot of smoke. And we'll do the same thing on the bottom, just so that you get an idea of what we're going to do. It's kind of fun at this point. I can look at it and see how well I've turned it. It's a little bit thicker up here, a little bit thinner here, but uh, for turning and not being able to measure exactly where the bottom was, I think it worked out pretty well. So we're going to cut these parts and we'll start here and work our way down. This is a weak spot. This is someplace that could probably break very, very easily because we have not very much wood right there. right now. I've got some uneven work here, so we want to clean it up. I definitely have some work that I need to do here, file it away. So we'll turn to a micromotor to clean this up. Um, somebody asked, how do you get rid of the char inside if you don't want it? One thing you can do when we cut, we're going clockwise. If you wanted to get rid of it, and I'm not sure, say you weren't going to bleach it, but you wanted to get rid of the black, if you go in reverse, so we're, we're used to cutting this way, but if you reverse your stroke, you can kind of stroke the black off. I, I don't like doing that. I would rather just bleach it, or I like the black on, on some pieces, I'll leave it black. I do a lot of finish work on some of my larger pieces will definitely have to clean this up. So we will switch to the micro motor now. All right, before we move on, this is what a new uh, 170, I believe it's 170L burr looks like. And I ordered them from a dental supply because this is actually a dental drill. All right, um, you can see now I have a different tool. This is a uh, NSK Evolution, it's a micromotor, and it is variable speed. Unlike the uh, dental drill tool, 
This one goes from 0 to 30,000, where the other one was about 300,000 RPM. Um, I can put a lot of different bits in here for texturing or uh, finishing, whatever I want. So this one, the handpiece, unlike a Fordham that has the uh, motor separate from the handpiece, this has got a small motor in the handpiece. And uh, right now I have a sanding drum on it. What we're going to use the sanding drum for is to smooth this area in here. You can see there's a little bit of a bump there. Uh, there's not a lot of black, but we're going to use this to smooth it out. I have different size uh, drums that I can use in this, depending on the piece. When this is completely cut out, I would probably use this big drum to uh, smooth out this area. And <coughs> so we'll start because we're sanding, it's same as with wood turning, lower the speed. This one I can start it either at the device or in the hand. Um, we can go in here, just fill it up a little bit. But that's pretty smooth. We could, we could get to a smaller drum and come in here if we needed to get closer, but I don't think we need to do that. Now, this area in here, let's turn this off. Um, I want to sand this. Uh, I've got some irregularities there. There are a number of different ways that I'll, I can work on that. One of the tools that I use most of the time are these little tiny rasps that are files that I got from Harbor Freight. Hold your work and just file away. Uh, I also have some sanding cones that we might be able to get in there with. I'll try a sanding cone. Just show it for a second. Okay, this is just a little cone on a mandrel that's uh, covered with sandpaper. I don't think this is going to go in here, but we can see how far it'll go. Yeah, I can get in there a little bit, a little way, and try to get that rounded over. Some of my other tools, some of the other sanders I have might work better to smooth this out. We can use it and get in here. I think I'm going to have to use a metal file for to smooth that area. We use it right in here. Kind of a bump down there that I want to get rid of. So another sanding device that I use, uh, when you're piercing, the wood fuzzes up. So I might also use one of these stars, sanding stars, to uh, take the fuzzies off. There are also 3M little uh, pads that you can use. I tried making one out of blue and unfortunately it put blue dye all over the piece so I think it's better to buy the 3M than to try to make your own. So I need a chuck for this piece because it's smaller. And here we can just run it over to decipher it both inside and outside. And this is also going to take off my pencil lines. Um, I'd probably use rubbing alcohol to try to get my pencil lines off when I'm finished. back to the files to try to get in here. I have another one. There's a curved file that I actually like a lot better. Uh, it's got 
One side is radius and the other is flat. And it's very, very good for getting in here. So we've got it a little bit smoother now. You can see there's, to finish these, when you, you've got a lot of cuts like this, a lot of shaping, there is going to be some time spent with the hand finishing. There are also abrasive tapes. I don't have one down here, it's up in the loft, but I might run an abrasive tape, And but I would need something to hold this so I could run it back and forth. Kind of like dental floss, um, it would fit in here. So this is a harder shape. Where you have cutouts like that, it's harder to clean it up. Um, what we're going to do next, we'll do a little bit of texturing so I can demo how we would texture the piece. This is another micro motor. It's called the Mistia. Uh, it does the same function as the Evolution that we just used. This one is a lot more portable. It's re rechargeable. Um, it's not... It just doesn't feel to me quite as good as the other one, but it's it's very nice for travel and it has the same speeds that the other one. What I have in here right now is a little tiny ball cutter. Um, and what we're going to use this for is for some texturing. It uses, unfortunately, this one only uses 332nd size bits and it doesn't have a collet. It would be a lot more versatile if I could use collets and different size burrs in it. So what this, I can use this for is just to add some texture and I can use different size balls if I want a different texture. Here I need to be careful because I could draw blood if I come off the wood, but I do need to support my wood while I'm texturing it. Um, the sawdust will collect inside of this, so periodically you need to brush it or blow it off, do something. So this is just one texture, and this is a texture I like a lot. I, I do this on a lot of my pieces. I think it shows off the work, and um, it's just kind of fun. So, So the wings are getting, these tips down here are going to be kind of fun to do too. You'll notice quite a difference when you blow the dust off. You may find that you have to go back and touch everything up. Okay, what I liked about the other machine is the on-off is in the hand piece as well as the machine. This one I have to reach over to the machine to shut it off. So I don't have a brush here, but we can blow it, and if we can zoom in on it, you can see that some of these holes need to be touched up. So I put on the magnifiers and go back and touch it up some more. I'll show you some other bits and um, carving devices that I use to add a little bit more depth and texture. So just a minute, and we'll bring those up. I have changed bits and I've changed machines. This is a diamond burr and um, it's cylinder shaped with a, an end. And what I've lately I've been trying to make my work, uh, even though it's 3D, even more dimensional. So what I want to use this for is to lower this part. So I'll just use it right up on the edge. Um, this is more of a carving tool, so we're going to increase the speed somewhat. 
And then what I'm going to want to do is just cut away so I'm trying to get some depth here. So even though we're only two millimeters thick, we still have a lot of, of room that we can work with. So I just am trying to define the area uh, outside the, or inside the border. So this is pretty coarse, it's, it's a pretty coarse cutter, so it's, it's pretty, uh, pretty uneven. Where it's, it's grinding away, it's leaving an uneven surface. So I do have something that we could clean that up with. I'll show it to you, I, don't, I won't demonstrate it. But you should be able to see a little bit of difference here, where we've got a little bit of a line between the, the pierced area and the textured area. I don't think it's necessary to lower the whole thing. If I did, we've got another sander that we can use for that. So there we've got a little bit of definition between the pierced area and the textured area. So. You should be able to see where we ground away with the diamond burr. It's very, very rough and we can smooth it out. Uh, I have a new tool. Unfortunately, I only have one. It's a roofing nail with a piece of sticky um, sandpaper on it. I have a leather punch, and with uh, this one, it's too big to run into any with any of these tools, so I have to use a Dremel, and I didn't bring the Dremel down, but with this, I could get right up into the this area and smooth it out, get pretty close into the corner to smooth out this area. But what I am going to use, this is a larger disc. Um, this I've gone back to the other micromotor. Let's turn it down a little bit more. And what I can use this for is if I wanted to lower the interior area or smooth it out, I can use this, this sander. Uh, to smooth that area out. So there's still quite a bit of finish work to do on this, but you can see now how using this sander really, really smooths it out. Let's get in here a little bit more. I can't get into the corner, but you can see where it's, it's much, much smoother now. This is just a flat sanding disc. Uh, I have bought, an, I think about a bulk 20 or 30 of these. And you can buy the adhesive uh, sandpaper, different grids to stick on there. But I got, when I started using the roofing nail, I bought two leather punches. And this, I, I just punch these out, it's peel off. Uh, I bought a roll of uh, adhesive sandpaper so I can stick these on. I've got 180, but I probably will get a 400 grit too. This is very aggressive, but it's really, really good. Uh, if you are doing a box and you want to sand the bottom of it and you have a little nub in there, this is a great way to take it off. Um, so there are all sorts of different sanding devices that you can use with the micromotor. Be creative. If somebody has a source of roofing nails with a smaller shank, I'd sure like to know about it. All right, once you have your wing completed and your angels completed, you can add finish to your angel, uh, whatever your preferred finish is, um, shellac, poly, nothing, oils, whatever. Um, I find which side of the angel I want to be the front, and most wood has a pretty grain, and it looks like an angel is folding her hands. <coughs> and then on the other side, I make a flat spot using one of the carving tools. And this is where 
the wing will attach and then I just super glue or epoxy glue the wing there and um, this wing has been bleached like I said earlier I usually bleach the wings so that would be my recommendation is bleach your wings or or don't okay. after I bleach any of my woods I use an archival spray it's the same thing that they spray on paintings it's a non yellowing so I don't they're not going to hold up forever in sunlight but it will protect them for a while so that's what I use with my bleach finishes yeah, the archival spray, uh, I believe the one I use is a Krylon that I get, uh, I believe I got mine down at Blix down in Portland, and that seems to be good. But I think any kind of um, uh, acrylic spray that is archival or non-yellowing or matte will work well for you. Bleaching. Uh, the bleach I use, this is a piece that I'm working on currently. This has got about six coats of bleach. It is a two-part bleach, part A and part B. I usually use about mm, less than a tablespoon of each part per application. I use a pipette. It's very caustic. I wear rubber gloves um, and I put it on. I buy really cheap basting brushes and baste it on. If you want to neutralize it after it's dried, you can use vinegar. I don't use that until I've finished it. This piece is still got some areas that are dark. This is Bradford Pear. Uh, originally the color was close to that color, so you can see a lot of the color has bleached out. I'd like it to be a little bit whiter before it's finished. Um, the Pipettes I use are disposable. I wash the um, pipettes and the brush as soon as I'm finished using it. The brushes don't last very long. Like I said, it is extremely caustic. It does build up. In, uh, the more applications you put on, the more it builds up. And when I'm finished, what I'll do is take a dental, trail, dental tool similar to, um, I don't have one down here, but just the same thing that you get from your hygienist and go around and clean every one of these holes and then knock the bleach out of it. The uh, uh, vinegar will take care of some of that, but not all of it. Uh, the brand that I use is Dailies. It's available at a paint store. You can get it uh, online. There are a number of different ones. The Zinser also makes a two-part bleach. All right, this is a piece uh, I said that when I'm piercing, everything is random. This is one that I had to draw out completely because it, there are large areas. The shape had to be totally laid out. The only part that's random in this is the piercing on the smaller wings. Everything else I laid out completely. And all these ribs had to be hand filed with the little... Um, rasps and uh, the, the sanding sticks and anything else I could find. I know other some people are using um, cut up hotel cards with sandpaper stuck to them to sand. I think those would work perfect and you could get a little bit of depth on it. But uh, where I said everything that I do is random, yeah the piercing is more or less random when there's a small area. When there's a big area it's all laid out. So this is kind of my tips and tricks part. Um, this is a balloon. Uh, not all balloons are created equal. This came from Fred Meyer. Uh, I've gotten some from Winko. Don't buy Winko balloons. They're too stiff. Uh, what I use a balloon for, there are basically two things. When I'm painting the outside of a piece like this, I have a tendency to hold it with my fingers and my fingers get paint and there are paint fingerprints on the piece. I found this works really, really well. Take your balloon, put it inside the piece, blow it up, tie a knot, and here you have a paint stand. So you can paint your piece if you're not air spraying, airbrushing it or something else. So this is number one use for this very important tool. The second use, this piece that I'm working on right now 
you can see as I've applied the uh, bleach, it has gotten misshapen. If I want it to get back to round, and the reason I know this, I had a piece that I sold, uh, but it wasn't quite finished, and in the process of finishing it, it got very, very misshapen. In fact, I had it turned over and one of the wings kind of collapsed on it. So rather than start over, I thought I'd see if I could salvage it. So I sprayed it with water, got it good and wet, blew up a balloon in it, and let it dry completely. The owner never knew that one of the wings was folded over part way. So this is Get a package of these for your shop. They're a lot. All right, the next thing I'd like to talk about is how I lay out a pattern, especially if um, there's an odd number. How do you get it so that it's all lined up and everything is the same size? We're going to do a little bit of a geometry lesson. Say we have a bowl, like this little bowl, and we want five segments. My indexer on my lathe has 48. 5 does not divide well into 48. So in order to get our 5 segments, we're going to play with a little bit of geometry. So what we'll do is take a compass and we're going to make a circle. It slipped. And then we're going to divide the circle into five. So we'll start with a line and five into 360, there are 360 degrees is 72. So what we want is 72 degrees per division. So I'm going to set this up at 72. This isn't the best one in the world, but uh, it's going to be close enough. So we'll put this center at 72, so this is at 0, and this is at 72, I hope. So a uh, longer line. Yeah, we have 72 degrees. Now if we take our, calib our um, compass and reset it so the arc from this 70 degree is the same. If we go around we should get equal divisions. We should get five divisions. Um, one, two, three, four. I don't know if I did this right or not. Okay, we'll draw a long line through each of these arcs. And we're missing one. Close enough. All right. One, two, three, four, five. So then we put our piece in the middle of the circle and mark where each of these lines comes through the circle. Now you can put it back on your lathe and just draw the lines, or you could go back to your zip tie and draw these lines in. So we have all of our lines marking our five divisions, and then we can put it on the lathe and turning by hand, on the lathe, draw in these these um, I think these are lati latitudinal lines uh, these aren't going to be very even but we would draw all of these lines in so we end up with a grid similar to what I have on this piece. This was done with a little bit more care. And then I had a shape that I worked with. And I, I really, really liked this shape and I wanted it repeated around. So I have all these intersections and this grid line. So it's just a matter 
of going from one piece to another and then copying. It's kind of like paint by number or draw by number or whatever. So I can just go back and forth and draw my pattern all the way around without using any tracing paper or anything else. Just by using eyeball. It's not going to be perfect, but you don't want it to be perfect. This isn't something that's done by computer or laser. This is your design. Okay, if you want to get into piercing, what do you need to get started? Well, don't use your um, Dremel that you've already got. It's, for one thing, the handpiece is too big, there's too much vibration, it will not pierce. It may have 30,000 RPM, but you need 300,000 RPM. It's really worth the investment to buy the dental drill, um, uh, air-driven tool that will pierce. You have to have something that will go at 300,000 or approximately between three and 400,000 RPM. That's if you want to do the piercing. For the micromotors, for the sanding, the texturing, all of those, um, there are so many out there that are available. I would suggest looking at the small portable ones are fairly inexpensive. It's a good start. Uh, don't do what I did. Find one that will accept multiple collets or multiple checks so that you can work with different size bits. The Evolution that I have is a much more expensive machine, but it is, it is really a nice machine. I like the fact that it's got the hand tool. But if you're starting, start small. You don't need something really big. Um, So what can you do when you first get started? Turn small. Turn little bowls and start piercing on them. You can turn things in spindle orientation and then uh, hollow them as you would with a box or turn them as in bowl orientation and make a small bowl. When I first started, when I started piercing, I started with bowls, uh, just a very small bowl. And then for the design, what you can do is follow the, the grain lines for a while. Then where they dip down, you're going to kind of freehand some sort of a design. And then just start with your design. Start piercing. One thing I've found, especially for beginning piercers, your hole size is going to change. So it's a good idea to work here, 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 here. So come back and forth constantly so you're referring to the same hole size so that you're, you're looking for consistency. Remember to keep your tool perpendicular to the work. Um, I like to see where I've been rather than where I'm going, so always keep your work turning. Uh, I know I'm left-handed and it's probably kind of awkward to watch. You would be probably going exactly the reverse of what I'm doing. This is a different spindle orientation. This is another thing you can do, something very small. This one I was playing with some textures and again following the grain lines for a while. And then I put in a little bit of a flare here. You, I think you saw that on the black piece that I made. Another, all right, another thing you can do that's very, very simple to do is a top. You know, we've all been making tops for a long time. Uh, the only difference with this top is instead of being a nice fat top that's going to spin forever, this is a really thin top. Uh, it spun pretty well until I put some holes in it and then it didn't work. If you're going to pierce the top, don't try to work from the, the top of it. It's too difficult. Turn it over. Another thing, have some way of knowing where it matches. Uh, you, you don't want to be piercing through a thick part, so what I do is um, I have the base and the top. There's a, a section that are both thick and they end at the same place. Also, I use a magic marker to delineate where I want the edge to be. So this one is fairly narrow. You might want a wider one. You could do a big top. Uh, there are all sorts of opportunities. A good practice for a beginner, get some basswood, some thin basswood and play with that. It's easier to pierce on a flat surface than a curved surface. But I think that once you get started, you're turning, uh, turning very thin 
and having some fun doing some piercing on some shape pieces. <laughs>